Good morning, everyone. My name is Dana White. And with me today, I have Dr. Lionel Corbett, Dr. Gard Jameson, Dr. Will Lin. And we are presenting today the first of a series of talks by Lionel Corbett. Today, it is called The Religious Function of the Psyche. Without a whole lot of introduction, let's turn it over to Lionel. And at the end, if you have questions, just raise your hand and um, we'll go from there. Welcome everyone. Thanks very much, Dana. What I'd like to talk about this morning is uh, Jung's approach to spirituality and religion and try and show how his approach is very different than traditional Jew Judeo-Christian approaches to spirituality. Uh, and in fact, in many ways, Jung's approach is actually completely incompatible with traditional religious systems. So it really is what I imagine to be a new myth of God. Um, what I've done is uh, focused on a particular kind of experience that was very important to Jung uh, that's called a numinous experience. So I want to begin by talking about numinous experiences. Um, uh, let me see, is that showing up as a yeah. slideshow? Yes. Um, so this is, this is... Um, it from the beginning, Lionel. Oh, from the beginning. Thank you. I needed the... Uh, no, I'm clicking that, but nothing is happening. I'm, I'm clicking slideshow from the beginning. Oh, well, I, I can't seem to get it to work. Is that, is that visible? Yes. Yes. I can't seem to get the slideshow to work even though I'm... So th this is roughly Jung's model of the psyche. Uh, and I'll try and show how it's relevant to religious experience. If you think of the psyche as a kind of, uh, what looks from the surface like an iceberg, at the tip we have everyday ego consciousness. This is the individual sense of me and you um, below that, we have the level that the Freudian tradition dealt with, which is repressed material from childhood, material that's shameful or painful or traumatic and so on. What Jung did, which was very original, was to describe a level below that level, below the personal level, which he calls, it has several names, it's sometimes called the objective psyche, the autonomous psyche, the mythopoetic level of the psyche, the collective unconscious, many names for it. The, but the point is that this is the source of all the gods and goddesses and religious experiences of all the religious traditions of humanity. It's the spiritual dimension of the psyche. And for Jung, this is where religious experience originates. So in contrast to traditional theistic ideas about God, um, religious experience doesn't arise in some heavenly realm somewhere else. It, it arises deeply within our own subjectivity from these deep levels of the psyche. So what that means is that if you can imagine that each of these little iceberg figures is a human being, so there would be seven and a half billion of them on the planet, all of us participate in this deep level of the psyche. And what that means is that imagery from any religious tradition can emerge into the individual psyche. It doesn't matter what the religious tradition is that you grew up in, because by, just by virtue of being human, you may dream of any god or goddess or religious imagery, not only from uh, current religions, but also from archaic religions. So you may have been born in North America, let's say, but you may dream of a Hindu god or goddess or an ancient Egyptian god or goddess, because all that material, as it were, is stored in this deep level of the psyche. So what Jung is doing is recalling the gods and goddesses to their, their original source in the, in the uh, deep level of the psyche. Let me go to the end of this to just give a, a, an example of what this looks like. This is the dream of a man who was uh, uh, raised in the Roman Catholic tradition, was actually a Roman Catholic priest, and all his life 
he'd been worshipping the divine in the usual, in, in his very traditional way. And to his enormous surprise, one day he had a, a dream in which this figure appeared to him in the sky above him. Now, normally this figure is only, uh, I think, four or five inches tall. Uh, I think, Dana, you may have one in, in, in your collections. There are many copies of it. This is the Venus of Willendorf. It's, it's from old Europe. It's dated to about 20,000 years ago. But in his dream, rather than being a tiny clay figure, she appears as an enormous goddess in the sky above him. And what happens in the dream is that he, he's holding a communion cup. He lifts it up. And then milk starts to pour from the breast of this goddess figure into the cup. And he says, I realized in the dream I was in the presence of something extremely holy. Now, this is completely surprising to him. This is not, obviously, this is not a, a Christian god image. It's, it's pagan. If anything, it's way pre-Christian. Now, why is this relevant? Th this is a very good example of how imagery from this deep level of the psyche popped up into this modern man's consciousness in, in a dream. Now, how, do, uh, uh, how does Jung talk about this kind of religious experience? Um, he, he draws on the work of a, of a, first of all, of a theologian called Rudolf Otto, who wrote a book called Das Heilige, The Holy, in 1917. Um, this book, by the way, is still in print. It's translated as the idea of the holy uh, in the English translation. And to talk about this kind of experience, Otto coined the term numinous. This is a word that uh, comes from a Latin uh, noun, numen, which means a god or a divinity. And he's, he, he thinks, Otto thinks that the source of all our religious experience comes from um, direct experiences of the sacred or the holy. And the important point is that they have a special quality, a special emotional quality. Uh, Otto is talking about experiences like Moses at the burning bush or Saul's experience on the road to Damascus, Job's experience of the whirlwind. Now, Otto says what all these experiences have in common and what that dream image also has in common with these experiences, these biblical experiences, is that they, these experiences have a special emotional quality. Otto uh, was a, basically a 19th century scholar, so he used this Latin phrase, mysterium tremendum et fascinans, meaning a mystery that's overwhelming and fascinating. And when people have these kind of experiences, and they're not confined to the founders of the tradition, like Jesus or Moses or Muhammad, these happen to ordinary people quite regularly. I'll give you some more examples. And when people have these kind of experiences, they use words like awesome, dreadful, terrifying, ineffable, uncanny. There's a sense that one is in contact with something completely unusual. So... They're so emotionally powerful that you can imagine what it must have been like for Moses to talking, talking to God out of a burning bush or Saul on the road to Damascus, hearing Jesus's voice saying, why do you persecute me? They make the subject feel very small. Sometimes the individual feel, feels blessed. Sometimes these experiences are terrifying. They can be the source of religious experience and so on. Um, we can't control these kind of experiences, and Otto thinks that they are completely an original type of experience. They can't be understood rationally. Now, uh, this slide's a little dense, I'm sorry. Um, I, I think I'll skip some of the... Uh, the, the, some of the questions that arise uh, with regard to Otto's work or whether we can be quite sure what the source is of these experiences. But I think that's perhaps uh, not necessary for our present purposes. The importance of Otto is that Jung borrowed Otto's concept 20 years later in his Terry lectures at Yale University. These were held every four years. They were on the psychology of religion. And in his lecture, Jung pointed out that he's hearing experiences with this emotional quality in the consulting room, but he pointed out they aren't necessarily taking a Judeo-Christian form. Uh, 
he was hearing experiences like that Venus of Willendorf experience, which is obviously not Judeo-Christian, but for the dreamer, it was extremely numinous. It was mysterious, tremendous, fascinating. So what Jung decided is it doesn't matter what the content of the experience is, only the emotional quality of the experience is important. And as I said before, you may experience this kind of imagery in a very surprising way, not necessarily from the tradition that you grew up in. Now, um, so Jung and Otto both agree that these experiences are experiences of the holy or the sacred, but there's a huge difference between them because Otto thought these experiences came from a kind of heavenly realm, from the transcendent God of Christianity or Judaism. Whereas for Jung, these are experiences of that deep, mythopoetic level of the psyche which is the source of all religious experience so so for Jung the, these experiences come from a level which is much more imminent whereas for for traditional judeo-christian theists the, these come from a transcendent realm for Jung the, the the sense of transcendence that these experiences produce really arises because they are what we would call non-ego. We're, we're very unfamiliar with them. Um, the experience of the deep level of the unconscious um, has that effect of being that we're in touch with something wholly other, wholly transcendent. But it's not transcendent in, in the sense of being in a heavenly realm. And of course, traditional theists would not accept an image like that Venus of Willendorf uh, uh, as something holy or sacred. They would say at best it's pagan. Um, but for Jung, these are simply forms of individual revelation. Now, this is another point of controversy because traditional religionists, traditional theists would, would say that revelation has stopped say at the end of the writing of the New Testament or with the end of the, of the Hebrew Bible or whatever, uh, that there's no more uh, revelation. But for Jung, these kind of experiences go on and on and on. You could have one in your dream tonight. So the man who had that Venus of Willendorf image in his dream was granted what Jung would call a personal or an individual revelation. And obviously, there's an important symbolic meaning to him, which is that the, the, the divine appears to him in the form of the sacred feminine. So he may have been, he was actually wor worshipping largely a male sky god. But sometimes one's, one's uh, real uh, religious feeling emerges in a numinous experience that acts as a kind of a course correction. Really, this man is a devotee of the goddess or the sacred feminine or the queen of heaven, however you want to talk about it. Um, uh, um, actually, when I asked him whether he talked about any, any, uh, this experience with any of his colleagues, he said no because it would cause too much controversy. He was actually in a religious order. Uh, and very often when people who are committed to a particular tradition have these kind of experiences, they're, they're a little bit shy of talking about them. Um, now, why are these experiences important? Jung thought that these experiences have a healing effect. Uh, in about, um, I forget if it was uh, 1944 or 45, something like that. He had a serious heart attack and he was in a, a, a kind of a toxic delirium for a few days. And he had a very powerful out of body experience that was extremely numinous. And after that, he wrote a letter in which he said that he thought that the approach to the numinous is the real therapy. And the reason he said that is that numinous experiences often address an issue in the, in, in, in the subject's life. Sometimes they talk about um, a developmental a difficulty, a complex, a life crisis that the person has. Um, and and they, they, they have such tremendous emotional intensity that they can even be helpful with, with very painful complexes. I just want to mention one more theorist in this uh, area um, that I think is very important. Uh, William James also wrote about these kind of experiences in his uh, Varieties of Religious Experience. Um, but he had um, a different set of criteria. 
which are also very helpful. He said the experience is ineffable. It's hard to describe the emotional quality in words. He said the experience is, uh, is noetic, which is a word that's not used very often. It means it tells you something that you didn't know before. And he pointed out that these experiences are transient. They don't last very long. Um, so, and of course, you can't make these experiences come and go. You might be able to prepare for them with spiritual practice like meditation or prayer or pilgrimage and so on. These uh, kind of spiritual practices might make the experiences more likely to occur, but sometimes they just occur spontaneously. And, and there's no guarantee that whatever practice you do, this, that these experiences will occur. They, they, they are, that's why Jung calls the, the deep level of the psyche the autonomous psyche. We can't control it. Now, this is an important aspect of, oh, maybe before I um, go on to uh, talk more about this, are, are there some comments from God or Will about this so far? Well, Lionel, thank you so much. Um, yep. Your presentation uh, as a student at Pacifica really affected me, and I want you to know in all my classes, I bring the religious function of the psyche into play. My, my question for you is this idea of personal religious experience. I know Jung didn't deny the transcendent, but he just said we need to focus on the psychic fact of what's in front of us. In other words, the dream or the vision or the experience of the numinous. Can, can you speak a little bit to this idea of personal religious experience? What does that mean to the individual who's having it? Well, it can mean many things. I mean, sometimes it, it um, points to uh, the individual in a direction that is different than the tradition in which the, the person was raised. Um, in that example of the Venus of Willendorf, um, this was a total surprise to this man. He had no idea that, uh, uh, that the essence of his spirituality had to do with the divine feminine. He had a, in other words, it produced a radically different change in his God image. It doesn't mean that he literally worships the Venus of Willendorf. They, they were the thought they are thought, by the way, those figures to be the earliest known images of the goddess. Uh, it's not completely certain that they were, but that's a, uh, a common theory. Um, it's a symbolic gesture telling him to move in the direction of the divine feminine and not to think of the divine in terms of a male sky god. So it can have that kind of effect. Um, also, it can have this kind of healing effect. And, it, and, it, and in people who've had no religious orientation, these kind of experiences can produce a religious conversion. Yeah. Um, so they can have a very profound effect on the personality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> Lionel, I'd like to express appreciation and also like to ask a, a question that might help me some. You know, first, I just want to speak, just say that uh, it's really obvious to me how valuable this conversation is right now. Uh, I think mm -hmm. that when you're calling for the numinous uh, as, a, as a guide for our own lives, when you're pointing out the fact that that's where the real healing is, I think it's a really important message in a time where we, many of us feel not only lost, but not sure where to look. And, you know, this encouragement, this discussion about, you know, looking in and looking to the true guide right now mm -hmm. and, and finding the numinous is uh, uh, contextually relevant, even without, you know, directly talking about it. Um, and with that, you know, is I, I've, like many of us, I'm feeling myself very deeply in this space where I'm, I'm touching base with myself. I'm having a lot of numinous experiences in the last month, and I, and I suspect I'm not the only one. But I also know that these type of numinous experiences, um, you know, there's a, when you start to open a relationship with the symbolic in your life, with, with the numinous, um, there's also a real danger uh, of doing that on your own and slipping into madness. <laughs> and so on one level, it feels spiritual and it feels valuable and I'm finding things. And on another, I'm finding myself um, wanting to be extremely vigilant uh, in relationship to my own psyche. So if you had any uh, pointers. Yeah, well, you, you, you thank you, uh, Will. You, you raised several important points. Um, one is, as it says on this particular slide, that, that um, if you over-identify with a numinous experience, it can make you either very inflated or even psychotic. 
And there's no doubt that uh, these experiences can trigger psychosis in very vulnerable people, especially when um, it's a type of experience that we call a visionary experience, which is like a dream except you're awake. Um, it's, it seems to come, it seems to be that you're in a dream that's happening on, on the outside. And I'll, I'll give some examples of that because they're, they're not all that uncommon, but they're rarely talked about. And when people have them, they're afraid that they've gone psychotic or something. Um, but there's a very different, there's a big difference between saying I've, I, I've had this experience uh, and I am the experience. This man didn't say, I am the Venus of Willendorf. That, that would make him psychotic. If you, if you relate to it, and especially, as I say here, if you express it in an individual way, uh, writing, painting, dancing, uh, some uh, expressive modality, then you relate to it. And then it doesn't possess you, and then you don't become inflated. So um, Jung thinks that the, you have to take a stand in, in relation to the experience. So I'm glad you raised that point. Um, and there is always the, the issue of, of um, what is the relationship between uh, having um, one of these kind of experiences in the waking state, like um, St. Paul uh, on the road to Damascus, um, who who heard Jesus' voice uh, saying, uh, why do you persecute me? He, um, that kind of experience can be reduced very easily. In his case, people have said he must have had temporal love epilepsy, which often produces religious experience. Or, you know, you can say the um, Moses in front of the burning bush was, was hallucinating, or it was an example of what's called pareidolia. When you look into the flames sometimes, you can, or clouds, you can see faces and so on. Um, so it's, it's, it's very easy to reduce these kind of waking experiences, waking visions, like Moses or, or Paul, um, to, uh, it's very easy to reduce them to some kind of brain aberration or some kind of, uh, you know, uh, accusations of what were you smoking, that kind of thing. But if Jung and Otto are correct, these are uh, what Otto calls sui generis, that means one of a kind. They're not reducible to psychosis or a hallucination or an overheated imagination or hysteria or something like that. Um, so, um, well, we can, if you want, we can go into this issue of psychosis a little further. But uh, what I, for the time being, I just want to say that these things happen to perfectly normal people. And, and as, as uh, William James said, they can be quite transient. So this issue of waking visions um, is very important in the context of the different ways that, num that numinous experiences can manifest themselves. The dream is the commonest manifestation. And I can give you some other dream examples if you like. Synchronistic events are also very numinous sometimes. Synchronistic events um, occur when some, uh, one's psychological state corresponds to an event in the outer world so that the inner and the outer, in an intensely meaningful way, so that the inner and the outer uh, are seen to have uh, to no, no longer be distinct, and that really links the inner and the outer, and it links matter and spirit. They're, they're very important experiences. Um, and then the the example of waking visions is very important, and I, I better uh, give an example of that in a moment. And then there are people who experience the numinous in the natural world or through the body. Um, let me just give an example of a, of a, of a numinous dream, <coughs> pardon me, and explain how they can have a he how these experiences can have a healing effect. So this was the dream of a woman who, who had a serious mother problem. Her mother was very critical of her, um, didn't like the fact that she was a woman, and was critical of her body and so on. And as I said before, um, the reason these experiences can be healing is that they, they can ad directly address this kind of psychological problem. This is obviously what we call a negative mother complex. So here's the dream. I'm in a glass elevator that has no visible cables heading up into space. The sky is clear blue. I can see for hundreds of miles. 
I'm pressed up against a group of beautiful otherworldly women who are swaying and singing a mesmerizing melody. We are naked. They lift me up, they hold me, stroke me, and embrace me. They sing of love, compassion, and forgiveness. There's a feeling of intimacy. They begin dripping honey on me, which feels loving and sweet. I'm filled with incredible peace and joy beyond words or description. Now you can sense from just that last sentence that this dream meets Otto's criteria. It's mysterious, it's fascinating, it's a tremendous emotionally powerful experience. And it had a profoundly healing effect on this painful mother complex. You can see that it stresses um, the beauty of the body of her body and the women's body who surround her who are celebrating the body uh, and the way they they embrace her and, and care for her is directly antithetical to the way she was treated in childhood um, and this uh, image of having honey dripped on her is extremely important, not simply because of its obvious symbolic meaning about sweetness, but also because uh, this is a good example of how uh, uh, mythic imagery can appear in, in, in the dream imagery of a modern person. In the goddess religions of antiquity, um, honey was used as an initiatory meal. It's not surprising that the devotees of the goddess uh, in ancient in antiquity were called the melissae or the bees because um, honey is a very powerful expression of the transformative effect of nature. Uh, the bee takes in pollen and then transforms it into a food just as mother takes in a food and transforms it into milk. Th this mystery of the transformative power of the feminine is, is symbolized by honey. So, it's an ex so that's why honey was used as an initiatory experience um, for uh, devotees of the goddess. So this dream not only compensates for the woman's uh, painful mother complex, but it also initiates her into a whole new level of appreciation of, of the female body and of being a woman. Um, and very commonly, numinous experiences actually have an initiatory effect. What I mean by that is they, they move the person into a new level of consciousness. That's a very common concomitant of these kind of experiences. Um, and th this has an extremely helpful effect on someone with this kind of problem. That, that's what Jung meant uh, when he said that these experiences have a healing effect. Um, and Jung said, um, these experiences are powerful um, and that's why they're helpful. As he says, this is the quote, the thing that cures a neurosis must be as convincing as the neurosis. And since the latter is only too real, the helpful experience must be real. So um, uh, that's a very good example of a healing experience. Uh, a healing numinous experience. I think that's the end of my PowerPoint. So I'm just going to stop sharing it now and come back to Zoom. Has it, uh, has it disappeared? Yes. Yes, okay, good. I have a question which, yes. um, as Otto describes the numinous, it's not necessarily always blissful and joyous and, and wonderful. No, you're quite right. It can be, it can be terrifying. But Absolutely. Is, yeah. is there a sense of assurance that comes on both sides of that coin, or how does how does the terrifying experience of the numinous is it compensatory? It, how is that relevant to personal religious experience? Well, let me use that question as a segue into the issue of visionary experiences, yeah. which which are often very frightening and so what i'd like to do is talk about a, a, a visionary experience of my own and i i'm doing this deliberately because um uh, when people have these kind of experiences they're often very reluctant to talk about them and i think it's about time we opened up discussion about the uh, visionary experiences and not uh, think that they're very peculiar or, or indicative of psychosis or something like that um, so a visionary experience is like being in a waking dream. The experience seems to come from the outside. So 
Paul's experience on the road to Damascus or Moses at the burning bush. This, this is what I mean by visionary experiences. So what happened to me happened about uh, 11 or years ago or so. Um, I was lying in bed when this happened. It happened during the night. Um, I, was, I know that I was wide awake. And I suddenly had the, uh, the sense that there was a figure standing next to my bed. It was a tall, gray figure. It looked like it was made of stone, but it was obviously alive. Uh, and when I looked at this figure, uh, it, um, I saw that it had three faces. There was a face looking down at me and a face coming out from either side of its head. Uh, it was extremely terrifying to address your question. You know, one one doesn't have these kind of experiences in one's bedroom. I mean, this was... but. Um, Certainly, it met um, uh, Otto's criteria. It was quite transient, so as James said, it didn't last more than a few seconds, but it was very distinct. Um, so it was mysterious, tremendous, fascinating, awesome, dreadful, uncanny, you know, whatever words one would like to use. Um, and uh, I had no idea what it meant. Uh, uh, I I didn't think that I was crazy or hysterical. I hadn't been smoking anything, or so I had no idea what this was about. So um, I started to research this kind of figure, uh, and basically, to cut a long story short, it turns out that there are many uh, archetypal figures that have either three heads or three faces. They're called tricephalic figures. Um, and there's a wide range of them. The Buddha sometimes appears with three heads or three faces, uh, Hecate, um, Kanunos. There's, there's quite a range of mythic imagery. I, for various reasons that I won't go into, uh, I decided uh, in consultation with colleagues that this was an image of the mythic uh, Hermes Mercury, who also appeared often with three heads or three faces. Now, the importance of that figure is that he, he was a messenger figure. He was a herald. When the gods on Olympus wanted to um, send a message to mortals, he would carry the message. So I realized that this was a message, but I didn't know what the message was, uh, except that I had a sense that it might be something frightening, which it was. A month later, I developed a very serious illness from which I nearly died. So, so um, this was obviously sent as a warning that something was going to happen. Now, um, can, can we say that this was helpful? In retro at the time, I didn't know what to make of it, but in retrospect, the way it helped me is it made me realize that there was some kind of background intelligence going on um, that knows what's going to happen. Jung thinks that there are realms of the psyche which are outside of time and space. And that's why we have prospective dreams and this kind of imagery, which announce what is going to happen. Um, and prospective dreams or prophetic dreams are actually not all that uncommon. Um, so uh, I don't like the idea that life is a tale told by an idiot. I prefer to think that there's a kind of background archetypal intelligence, the, the intelligent order of the universe, and that this knew that something was going to happen to me. And I found that helpful. I found that reassuring. Um, th there is a whole other debate here about um, how the illness fits into the individuation process and so on, which I think might take us slightly off the subject. So Lionel, yep. Jung had his own waking visions uh, prior to World War I. Yes, yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? And I believe at the end of his life, he, 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 he had another vision of a worldwide catastrophic event, which Marie-Louise von Franz says in his vision didn't encompass the whole world. It didn't destroy the planet, but it was a worldwide. You don't know any details about that vision? No. Just <clears throat> she was reporting uh, in the uh, interview that toward the end of his life he had this vision. Yeah. And there's part of me that maybe wants to say maybe we're kind of in that apocalyptic moment right now. Yeah. Um, 
And the one just before the First World War was a vision of sheets of ice covering your and destruction covering Europe. I've forgotten the details, but I know yeah. that when and, and the rivers about. were full of red blood. Red and, blood, yeah, 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 yeah. So he had that kind of visionary sensibility, obviously. Um, um, and they're probably uh, uh, these kind of experiences are probably still occurring, but we don't have a a forum to talk about them. That's actually why I started this little organization, Psyche and the Sacred, so that people would have a, a place to talk about these kind of experiences. Because it's actually very difficult. Um, when you have one of these experiences, it's, it's hard to know who to talk to. You know, there's an old saying that the difference between the, the mystic and the schizophrenic is that the mystic knows who not to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk um, a little more about the forum you created uh, in case anybody listening would like yeah, to tap into yeah, that? Yes. Um, well, it, it has two components to it. Um, usually on Friday night, I, I give a talk like this one uh, where I talk about some of the ideas. And then on Saturday and Sunday, uh, we, uh, we meet in a small group, maybe 10 or 12 people, and we uh, we simply sit around and share dreams and these kind of experiences. Um, and it's uh, intended to be a contained way of talking about them. You see, people very often, when they have these kind of experiences, they, they can't go to their minister. Um, sometimes I, I've had the patients that I've worked with in, in therapy who've had very powerful numinous experiences, but because they were not traditionally Judeo-Christian, um, they were dismissed. For example, I remember a, a dream of a woman who dreamt of Jesus as a woman. And her minister told her that this was sent by the devil to deceive her. <laughs> uh, now, he was obviously a bit of a fundamentalist because obviously that dream has powerful symbolic meaning. The divine has a feminine aspect as well as, and so on. It wouldn't be hard to, uh, um, to un unpack it, but... but um, it's um, the the more fundamentalist uh, wing of the tradition uh, will, uh, if especially if you have a very rigid Christology, only wants to accept very traditional religious experience. Whereas what Jung does is he ex widely expands the range of numinous experiences, um, and he does it purely. He, he, he the criteria for knowing that something is an experience of the sacred or the holy is only this emotional quality of numinosity, not the content. Um, so for example, I, I once had a, a, a very powerful dream of an enormous UFO, something of the size of that um, Close Encounters UFO, um, that came down and hovered a short distance above my head. And the thing was so big and so close that that was very terrifying. And then lights started to shine down on me. And when I looked up, I saw that the base of this UFO was covered in eyes. And the light was pouring out of the eyes. Now that was, uh, that dream was quite frightening, quite awesome, mysterious, terrifying, dreadful, you know, all those. So it meets Otto's criteria. So Jung would certainly say this was a numinous experience. And Jung would say this is an experience of the self, the self with a capital letter S, meaning what, what he calls the God within, an, a, an internal image of the divine that is a priori. A priori means it's not internalized. You, you're, it's present all the time at birth. Um, it's not the result of experience. Why do I say it's a self symbol? Um, because it's mandala shaped. It's a perfect mandala. You remember that um, the mandalas are highly symmetrical diagrams, usually combinations of circles, squares, and crosses, but they're always very symmetrical. So a UFO like that is a perfect mandala. Yes, in and, uh, Dreams and Reflections, didn't Jung have an experience of himself as an eyeball uh, experiencing the universe? Oh, he, uh, he ex yeah, in that uh, vision that he had after the heart attack, he was above the earth looking yeah. down on it. Yes, that's right. Yes. Um, so, so, um, so the point I was trying to get at was that 
traditional Judeo-Christian theists would not accept a dream like that as an experience of the inner divine, but Jung would. Jung would say this, is an ex this dream is a dream of the self, the transpersonal self, the self written with a capital letter S, as distinct from the personal self, yourself and myself. Um, and any of us can have a numinous experience of the self at any time. You may go to bed tonight and have one. Um, and uh, it may not take a, a Judeo-Christian form. And this is why, um, but it can act as a revelation. Uh, in that case, the, the, there's a teaching that, uh, remember that one of Otto's criteria of, um, sorry, uh, William James's criteria was the noetic quality, the, the quality of giving you information. The information here is... <laughs> The information here is you are seen by that, where that has a capital T. Um, so perhaps that was compensating for a feeling of not being seen and so on. One could keep amplifying the dream. But, but um, they're not random. Th these experiences are always tailored to the individual's experience. So I'm curious, in indigenous traditions, they would often go down to the river or they would gather around the fire and they would talk about their dreams in the morning. Yeah. What is it about modern culture that we're afraid to do that? Is it the development of the ego structure or what? Well, what it's because we, we uh, modern culture doesn't understand what Jung referred to as the, the uh, reality of the psyche. Uh, when you have a dream, it's very easy to dismiss the dream as, quote, nothing but, as if it's not significant. It's only psychological, as if that means it's not real. One of Jung's very major important points is that the psyche is real. So that a dream image is, a, is an image of something real. It's, it has its own ontological existence. And that level gives you information that's as real as the information that you get from the five senses and from the intellect. It gives you, it gives you real information. So the, the notion of the reality of the psyche hasn't penetrated into the culture. That's very unfortunate. And, and, and why do you think that is from a, a, a developmental standpoint? I mean, indigenous cultures were very permeable and they, they appreciated these dreams and they, I believe, differentiated between big dreams and small dreams. Uh, yeah, well, uh, you're a philosopher. I mean, the, the, the culture and the academy is Aristotelian. Yeah. The, the, this is a platonic mode of being. It, it's a two-world theory. Yeah. We live in the everyday, ordinary, consensual reality, but there's an, a subtle realm or a, a spiritual dimension that's not immediately accessible to the five senses, but does erupt into into ordinary awareness in these kinds of ways and that's not a popular view in, in academic circles so Jung's notion that that there's a spiritual essence in the personality would be unpopular in in most university circles because they don't like uh, essentialist theories and this is an essentialist now if you don't believe there's a spiritual essence to the personality this will all be nonsense so that's really um, a matter of one's own commitments. It's, I think there's good empirical evidence. I think Jung, in some ways, was an empiricist and a phenomenologist. He's just describing anyone can have these experiences and we can describe them. There's nothing mystical about them. Um, Jung was often accused of being trying, of straying from his lane into theology instead of staying in psychology. But he, he said, look, I'm just talking about people's experiences. That's, that makes me a psychologist. Now, if you, um, there was a point you raised before, which is, what is the relationship between these intrapsychic experiences, like the UFO and, or, or the, the, the wonderful dream of the women in the elevator? Is there any relationship between the, those kind of images and the transcendent God of Judaism and Christianity and Islam. I mean, is the self, the image in the psyche that we experience, an image of what the theologians are talking about? Or can we, can we know? Uh, I think Jung probably privately believed, uh, well, he said actually somewhere that, that our images are images of something. He said there is an original beyond the image that the image is pointing to. But you can't really prove that. It's a matter of belief. 
So for a lot of Jungians, these kind of experiences are experiences of the inner divine. But you couldn't, you couldn't be 100% certain that that, refer, that the dream image tells you anything about the transcendent God of, of the theistic traditions. We just have to live with uncertainty. But I'm happy with what we've got. I mean, it's just, <laughs> just as you cannot say whether, you can't say whether the deep levels, the, the mythopoetic levels of the psyche are generating religious experience, mm -hmm. or whether there is a transcendent God beyond the psyche, which is using the psyche as a kind of medium of transmission. Um, uh, Jung got into all kinds of arguments with Martin Buber and uh, Victor White and various theologians who accused him of, uh, Buber accused him of psychologism, meaning that he was reducing the transcendent God um, of the theistic traditions to, quote, nothing but an intrapsychic image. And Jung said, look, uh, Martin, you just don't understand that these images are real. Mm -hmm. Um, he could, they could never resolve that kind of tension. And I think it's still a tension. There's a lovely line from Lao Tzu that suggests that when people lack a sense of awe, there will be disaster. You, would you reflect upon that personally and collectively? Well, the sense of awe is one of the main characteristics of numinous experiences. And, um, and actually, I, I skipped over the slide that talked about some of what are called the epistemological problems with Otto and Jung, which, which is the problem of how can you say what the source of these experiences is. If I'm watching a, a tremendously powerful sunset and I'm awestruck or I look into the skies at, uh, at night and I see these wonderful stars and I'm awestruck, um, some skeptics would say, well, you're awestruck by the power of nature. It has nothing to do with God. So, uh, you're... Mm -hmm. Sorry. It's so interesting when these interruptions occur, isn't it? Uh, yeah, my apologies. I don't know. That's all right. No, no, no. Um, maybe, maybe it was just a little musical background to the conversation. Yeah. Um, so, so um, in other words, it, it's possible to reduce these kind of experiences. Um, and, um, and not attribute them to experiences of the divine. It's possible to just say they're natural phenomena. They have no special religious significance. You um, think when we deny those experiences or when we reduce those experiences, as Lao Tzu says, um, we're going to experience a higher degree of neurosis or a complex in our lives? Um, well, I think that uh, having a, 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 a spirituality is very helpful in dealing with psychological difficulties. Um, Jung, you remember, felt that uh, when people came to see him who were in midlife or past midlife, that they had to develop some kind of spiritual attitude to their difficulties, that it was insufficient to try to solve the problem at its own level. It really needed a spiritual background. He didn't mean that you had to belong to one of the creedal systems. You don't have to belong to a church or synagogue or something. You, you can develop a personal spirituality based entirely on contact with the objective psyche. And this is another way in which um, Jung's approach to spirituality is actually incompatible with the, the uh, traditional theistic systems. There are some other ways as well. For example, Jung thought that the, the, the transpersonal self, the inner divine, the image of God that we have cannot be thought to have just a light side. It has a dark side and a light side. So for example, um, um, well, the, the traditions talk about God as loving and, and so on. And certainly that is obviously correct, but it's, it's, Jung would say it's a, it's a partial description. Uh, and if you look at um, horrific, say, historical events like the Holocaust or, or the, the current pandemic, Jung would say these are examples of the dark side of the, sen of the self. They are more than purely human. They are on such a vast scale and they cause such terrible suffering that we can't attribute them to purely human factors. Um, so that he thought that our image of God has to have a dark side to it. 
And so, for example, the image of Christ is only a partial or, uh, image of the self because it's too light, it's too exclusively light. It's not that it's wrong. He would say it's only partial. You have, uh, otherwise, you have to split off evil and project it onto the devil or the Antichrist. And what he wants to do is have a God image that includes a light side and a dark side. And this is another reason that he got in trouble with Victor White and Huber. And yeah. It's an unpopular idea that the divine could have a dark side to it. Well, it's ironical because the father of modern psychology, Schleiermacher, said that he encouraged, right, no more secondhand religion. Oh, yes, yes. Or just have a direct experience of the divine. Yeah, Schleiermacher is one of Jung's spiritual ancestors. I mean, he, he, the emphasis on feeling is very important. Yeah. yeah. And can you speak to how the pandemic might be a collective, numinous experience? Well, uh, just look at the shape of the coronavirus. It's a, it's a perfect sphere. And, and the sphere is, is an example of mandala imagery. And then if you, so, so it's certainly a self symbol. And uh, if you think about the fact that the, the problem emerged from bats, which live in deep, dark, underground caverns and caves. I mean, just imagine it symbolically. You have the emergence from the underworld into our, into cons our reality of something very, very damaging in the form of the self, in the form of a, a, a spherical mandala. It's actually a perfect example of the dark side of the self. And the problem is, um, but I mean, if you set this tradi traditional theist who thinks that God is only love and light, I think it's the first letter of John that says, uh, he is only light and in him there is no darkness. If you, if you take that view of God, this is going to be anathema to say that this pandemic uh, is is an example of the dark side of God. I mean, that would be a a, a, a terrible thing to say. Well, and it's interesting because our metaphor is that we're at war with this yeah. virus. Yeah. I'm not sure Jung would agree with that metaphor, that way of understanding what's happening right now. It's it's not a good metaphor. We, we have because we have to respond to the pandemic at the same time as we accept it as somehow necessary. Um, acceptance um, means that you respond to it uh, without um, um, responding out, just out of rage, mm -hmm. that you try to um, deal with it. Obviously, we have to try to deal with it, but you have to, you have to understand what it means, what it's pointing to, why it happened. Uh, what what the T loss is the the goal that it's aiming at that it's the, that it's the result of a larger intelligence um, and what do we learn from it and so on uh, that's what I mean by accepting that somehow this is necessary and the war metaphor is is very limited it's uh, not a good one some have suggested we're moving from an age of independence to an age of interdependence. And that mandala image of the virus, I think, is a very powerful image in relation to that. Could you maybe speak to, perhaps, maybe there's a shifting? Uh, Jung said maybe it would take five, six hundred years for this shifting to occur, but could you talk about this? Maybe we're at the beginning of it. Yeah, well, um, uh, in... Um, uh, well, how can I say? Um, there, there's an idea that I think was first suggested by Edward Edinger, who was an, a Los Angeles analyst in the 80s, that Jung's approach to spirituality is what Edinger called an, the new dispensation, by which he meant a new, in the West, not in the East so much, but in the West, that, that there's a new way in which divine grace is dispensed or emerging into the world. The, uh, just roughly to summarize Edinger, the first dispensation was the revelation at Mount Sinai. The second was the appearance of Christ. But the new one is this sense that we're in touch with the objective psyche, with the mythopoetic level of the psyche, having these kind of experiences. And that that is the beginning, essentially, of a new religious form. So your question is really, how long will this take to emerge into the culture? And there is some evidence, although not very much, but that it will take a few hundred years, that in Max Zeller's book on dreams, he says he asked, asked Jung 
uh, he, he told Jung about a dream in which um, a temple is being built. And I think just the foundations had been laid. And he asked Jung if this was the foundations of, of, of a new spiritual form and perhaps a new religious form. And Jung said he'd heard similar dreams, but that he thought it would be, I think he said 600 years or something before this thing is built, this new temple is built. So if this idea is correct, um, and some people object to it, they, they, they want psychotherapy and so on and psychology to be a purely secular pursuit. But, but if this theory is correct, then we're only at the very beginning of this. So we're just laying the foundations to it. Um, and, um, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. But it, 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 for many people already, this is a personal spiritual practice, being in touch with this kind of work. Yes, yes. It seems that one of my teachers, Edgar Breitman, suggested that philosophy must concern itself with all accessible experience. Mm -hmm. It seems that's what Jung insisted upon, that we... If we neglect the facts, as, as Lao Tzu suggests, then there will be disaster. And it seems as if our secular society, uh, our institutions, I ask my students, how many of you trust your religious institutions? And oh, hundreds of them now, zero. Yeah. Political, economic institutions, zero. They don't trust institutions. Yeah, well, this is where Jung is useful because uh, there are many people who have a personal sense of the sacred, but they can't trust an institution. They don't, the politics don't work for them or the, the particular God image of the institution doesn't work for them. Um, they don't accept the Bible stories, for example, as literal history. At best, they're mythological stories. Um, so if, if you can't believe any of the traditional stories and you have a, a personal sense of the sacred, where do you go? Well, Jung's approach is one, one place to go. Yeah, there are ancient philosophers and often he said if, if if oxen horses had hands and could draw their gods yes, look yes. like oxes and horses yeah. and oftentimes i when my students come up and declare their atheism i say tell me about the god you don't believe in because i probably don't believe in that one either yes exactly they're repudiating the traditional theistic god image exactly. but with this approach of jung um has nothing to do with that. You may have, as we've seen, you may have God images that uh, are nothing like the traditional God image. So this really is a new, a new mythic image of God. It's quite radically new. And um, in the Red Book, Jung says, a new image of God is being born in the human soul, albeit ag against resistance, because it's, it's hard to um, change one's the way of, uh, of thinking that was one was raised in. Uh, it's no coincidence that in, in the Red Book that the figures that um, appear to um, uh, Jung are uh, figures like Elijah and Salome. These are very important in the evolution. Well, Elijah, of course, was very resistant to any new God image. He, he, was, a, he was a believer in, in the traditional Yahwistic Hebrew Bible God image. Right. Um, so um, he would have resisted this terribly. <laughs> so, so Jung had to cope with the Elijah principle, you see. Yes. To, 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 to this. And he was carried away in a chariot of fire. <laughs> yes, he, he, which I suspect was a UFO, by the way. <laughs>